안녕. 안녕. are used in developing games and that we've found to be useful uh, that my team and I have used in all our development and also common patterns that are not often followed by a lot of the developers that I've met and we're going to go over some of the best practices that can be used to improve your game development and the performance of your games especially on devices <clears throat> But first today I would like to start by asking all of you a question. If this was your house, what would you do? Would you bulldoze it? All right? Would you move to another house? Yeah? Would you continue to live in it? Okay, we have some. <laughs> Or would you call the police because you've obviously been robbed? Yes? No? So the answer that we suggest is that you should fix the windows. So there's a theory right broken windows theory that appearances matter yeah the quality of your neighborhood matters so in new york city in albuquerque new mexico and in the netherlands it's been discovered that improving the physical appearance of your neighborhood shows it it, it reduces crime and increases quality of life so This is basic, right? I mean, people are influenced by their environment. The environment builds social norms and people will conform to these norms. So if you had a really dirty, a really filthy uh neighborhood, yeah? You can imagine petty crime increasing. People with families would avoid the neighborhood or they would move. Right? um and then there's the someone else's problem problem which is when it's dirty no one wants to own it so they'll say yeah that's someone else's problem so there's very little ownership and therefore there's very little value on the opposite side if your neighborhood is neat and clean yes well maintained If your neighborhood is a good neighborhood to live in, you you feel value, you feel ownership. You're proud to be part of that neighborhood. And the people who live in such a neighborhood will also check to make sure that no one else damages it, right? So, this is called the broken windows theory. So you fix your windows, your neighborhood appearance improves, and therefore you have a better neighborhood to live in a safer neighborhood to live in so what does this have to do with game development what's he talking about broken windows buildings so let's start here unity the freedom of developing in unity right we have a rich set of building blocks in unity you can do physics you can do animation you can do you know uh, 2d right you can do all sorts of things so it's flexible too right you can write your scripts any way you want to write them you can name them anything you want to and there are hundreds of ways to build projects and trust me developers use every single one of them all these ways <clears throat> so as an evangelist in my region i've traveled around and i've met a lot of developers and i've seen a lot of projects and 
whenever we find a project that is having problems, if you follow it, if you track it down to its core, the cause is architecture. From architecture, all the other problems emerge. <clears throat> so that foundation is usually shaky. And then on top of that, they build, and they want to add more functions and more features, and you have issues. So let's look at a typical project. The errors and warnings are deliberate. So this is a contrived example, of course. I've never seen one this bad, but I've come across similar. So people name things in all sorts of ways, yeah? So this guy's scene is named 001 underscore GM SCN. I don't know what that means. And if I had written a project like this and named it like that, I may have meant game scene when I started. But when I come back to it a month later, I can't remember what that means. So the naming is problematic. And then maybe you want to mark it in a way that you know that this was the art director's idea. So I'm going to try a scene where he did something. So I add that on the back. Or I don't like this level, so it sucks, in brackets. Also, why are all the files in the root folder, right? All clumped together. This is very common. Um, bad folder management is very common. So we're talking about the project architecture to begin with, how you are organizing yourself. So the first thing that uh, I want to talk about here is Sorry. Yeah, so when you have architecture like that, of course game development is a pain, right? But if we improve that, we make it more we make it more organized then game development becomes the joy it's supposed to be. You have to have a good time making your games. You don't want it to be a pain. So let's look at what you need. Let's look at what you actually really need. Right? You can get all the features. You can put all of that on top of this. But if the structure is good, you can reuse it for efficiency, and it will be robust. OK. So some basic standards. Good architecture starts with good standards. So you've got to use C Sharp. There are many, many reasons why you should. One of them is that it's strongly typed. This is good. It allows you to figure out what's wrong with your projects a lot more easily. No mysterious things going on. So use C Sharp. I won't go into detail. This is not supposed to be a discussion of programming. You need good naming conventions. So this goes back to the project we saw earlier, where things are called 001 and GM scene. You want to use descriptive names, right? A name is there for a reason. It's supposed to tell you what a thing is. So use that well. Use long names. Use big names. And use standardized capitalization so that your windows are not broken right, or dirty, so they look good, so you understand what you're reading. And then when you pass that to other members of your team, you all know what you're looking at. And in Unity, don't be afraid of using spaces and names. That's something I see a lot. It's not necessary. It works fine. Just don't do it in code, right? That's all. Everywhere else is fine. And you want a logical folder structure. Cool? So if you do that, that's essentially the same project. I, I took this one and I destroyed it to make the other one, right? It's a lot easier to understand what's going on. The scenes are in a scene folder. They're named properly. I know this is very basic, but it's surprising how often this is not. Um, so this is something that teams don't do until it's critical, until they get to a point in their development 
where, yes, naming correctly folders matters. So the, the materials are named agent space material. Agent for the prefab is in the prefabs folder. All the scenes are in the scene folder, and so on. Immediately, you know what the project's about. You can write this. You can close it. You can go on vacation, come back a month later, and you know exactly what's going on. OK. <clears throat> also, we would like to advocate a zero-tolerance a zero policy for warnings and errors. Again, it's broken windows, right? Errors, everyone fixes, because otherwise you can't compile your code. No problem. Of course, you fix your errors. But warnings, people leave them hanging out. Yeah, it's OK. Don't worry about that. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. But not always. And why do you have warnings? What's going on? So follow up even the warnings and keep it clean. Because you may know now, but again, when you come back to that problem later, you may have forgotten the source of the warning. So zero tolerance on warnings and errors. And also, zero tolerance for runtime memory allocation. This is, as much as possible, avoidable. This, this can be done. And we've found ways to do it in many of the procedures that are common. And we're going to share, I'm going to share some of that code that I've uh, worked on with my team, with you guys today. And there'll even be a download later for you guys to get a template of how all of this works. And then you can run it through the profiler and see what the performance is like and build projects on top of that. Cool. OK, so that's project architecture. That's just naming, getting things right, OK? Keeping yourself organized. So now we want to talk about, so we're going to get a bit more into the code here. We're going to get a little bit more technical. We're going to talk about the application logic. So our advice is to use the main controller. <clears throat> Basically, we use a base controller that we name main controller, and it acts as a manager for the high-level application. So it uses public static methods so all the other classes can access it. Okay, this is the central class in your game. And then we use object don't destroy on load because we want it to persist. Yeah? So when you load the levels, it remains there. So it's available throughout the project. So the main controller also loads all the other scenes. They're loaded on top of it. And the main controller itself loads and unloads these scenes and cleans up afterwards. So I've got a few visuals that may help make that a bit clearer. <clears throat> so what we use is a scene state machine in the main controller for the loading procedure. And the first state is a reset state, where we call GC Collect directly to try and reclaim some memory. We do this at the very beginning so that we don't have to do it at runtime, and then we avoid all runtime memory allocation afterwards. That way, we avoid getting a GC collect call during the update loop of the game. So then, once we're done resetting, we transition to a preload state. Here, what we want to do is we want to use an asynchronous operation to start loading the level. And then we change the state to load. This is also a good place to run processes just before the scene loads. So if you need something to run just before loading, I would do it in the preload state. Then we load. So what we do is we load the level asynchronously. And then we check whether the asynchronous operation is done. And when it's done, we transition to the next. This is a good place to update your progress bars, You know, your loading progress bars. You would do it in the load state. Then when we're done, we go to unloading. Because when you're done loading a level, there's going to be some unused resources sitting around in memory. So we want to do a resources unload unused assets. And we do this in the unload state. 
This is also asynchronous, so we keep going until unloading is done. OK, so then we're done. When unloading is all done, we transition to a post-load state. This is where we do things immediately after loading. And we also update one of the variables that we're using to track the current scene. After post-load, we transition to one more state. This is a ready state. This happens just before run. So if you need to do anything just before beginning, you do it here. But this is also your last chance to call GC Collect before we hit the runtime. So this state is specially for that. But you want to avoid doing this if you've got any assets that you're loading that you may want to use in the level, but you want to load them and keep them in memory. GC Collect will clear that up. So avoid if you want to do that. <coughs> So, as I said, this is a good place to do things just before the beginning. So, you know, in games, when you get loading, 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 click to continue, and then there's a tip. Did you know that plasma tanks are immune to cold attacks? That's a good place to do it. And finally, the state that we want to get to, right? We want the game to run. So we get here, and then the main controller, all along, it's been staying at the bottom, in the back. It's done all of this for us, and now it can rest. It can wait. It doesn't do anything until the current level is not equal to the next level. Now, how did that happen? Remember, we're using static public methods in the main controller. So the, we've got one called switch scene. And again, I'll show you all the code after this, so we'll walk through it together. But switch scene can be called from anywhere. So the level uh, loading can be triggered from any of the other controllers. OK. So we know the idea. We know what we want to do. But how are we going to do this? So we can use a switch case, right? But if anyone's done a switch case with more than 10 or so states, you'll very quickly run into something that's not much fun to maintain. You've got to update it as well as your states. And it gets hard to read. So an, another common um, pattern that people use are delegates as states. Unfortunately, we have a zero tolerance on runtime memory allocation. And setting a delegate allocates memory. So if you do that at runtime, at some point, the garbage collector is going to kick in, and then you've got a hiccup. Again, you won't notice this on PCs, but when you deploy to device, you want to, you want to get it on mobile, suddenly there's a hiccup. And if you're playing a shooting game, no fun. So what do we do? So we use an array of delegates. This way, we can preset all the delegates once. And we never do it again. And I'll show you how we do that. So let's look at how the main controller works with two other controllers that represent levels in, this, in the game. And then we'll look at what it looks like in the profiler as well. OK, so let's see. Okay, so this is our main controller. As you can see, we keep track of two strings called current and next scene name. We have two asynchronous operations. One is for unloading the resources, and one is for loading the scene. And then the part that we use to get the delegates to work is we have an enum, an enumeration for scene state. And as you can see, it's the same name as all the states that we used earlier. Reset, preload, load, 
unload, postload, ready, run. And count is there so that you can find the number of elements in the enumeration. And then we have a scene state of type scene state. And instead of one delegate that we keep on setting, we maintain an array called update delegates. <coughs> we'll look at the public static method later on. But first, I want to show you what we do when we wake up. So when we wake, when we hit awake, <coughs> first thing we do is we keep this main controller alive between scene changes. So we use don't destroy on load. Yeah, this keeps it there as the scenes are loaded. Next, we want to set up a singleton instance. So the main controller is this. And then we set up the array of update delegates. So we make as many update delegates as there are elements in the enumeration. And then we set each of them. So what we do is we cast the scene states to integers, and we use the index. And then we point it at each of the update methods. So we have an update method for each state, this section here. OK. And then we set the next scene to be the menu scene. So this is how we start it. This is how we get it going. And then we set the scene state to reset, which is state number one. And then we set the camera, which is fine. <coughs> so also, I want to show you that even here, we are doing some good housekeeping. So on destroy, when you're done, you want to be nice to your memory. So clean up your delegates, yeah? So here, we check if update delegates are not null. Then we iterate through them, and we null them. And then we null the array itself. And we null the singleton instance. So at the very top, in the update loop, we check if update delegates at index scene state casted to an integer, if that is not null, then we run that delegate, yeah? And that's how all the states run. And here they are. First, the update scene, reset. So here we run a GC pass, so that we only run it here. It doesn't happen at runtime. And then we switch to preloading. In the preload stage, we do, this is how we start the loading. We do load level, async, next scene name. And then, next, we switch to load. Now load stays in a loop, stays in a loop, until the scene load task, the asynchronous operation, until it's done. If it's done, then we switch to unload. Now, if you needed to do a progress bar or anything, this would be the place to do it. So then when we're done, we've switched to unload. We need to run another async operation. This one is for cleaning up the resources. So we check if the resource unload task async operation is null. If it's not, sorry, if it is, then we set it. What we want to do is resources unload unused assets. And if we are done, then we set it to null and we switch to postload. Now, in postload, we make sure that current scene is the same as next scene, because that's how we're going to check if we need to start the loading sequence again. And then we jump to scene state ready. And this is our last chance to do a garbage collect before the game runs. So if you have any assets loaded in the scene, this is in the template that I'm going to let you guys download. There's a little note, don't do this here if you have any assets loaded in the scene that you may want to use. <coughs> and then we switch to run. 
And this is where the main controller sits on the back burner and waits for current scene to not equal next scene. If it does, then we start the whole thing all over again. OK. So how do the other controllers make this happen? So we've got a controller called Menu Controller, which we attach to the main camera in a scene called Menu. And it's very simple. It has a singleton instance, right? And we do the nice awake, the nice clean up on destroy. And then all the way at the bottom, if the left mouse button is clicked, then main controller, switch scene, game scene. Similarly, the game controller, which is the scene controller for the game scene, has all the same stuff. And at the bottom, if we click the mouse, the left mouse button, then we switch the scene to the menu scene. OK, we go main controller, switch scene, menu scene. OK, so let's see this in action. It's not terribly exciting, but it is very clean. So first of all, you want to make sure you've got your main scene loaded up. And as you can see, there's a primary camera there just to show you that there's something there from the main scene. Now we hit play. So what it's done, primary camera is still there. It's loaded in the menu scene. So there's the menu scene's camera is main camera, and the info text is a 3D text sitting in the scene that says left click to load the game scene. And of course, if you left click, Now we've loaded the game scene. As you can see, the menu scene's camera has been cleared up, and all the stuff from the game scene has been loaded in. A few things called agent, a light, some more instructions, and its own camera. Cool. So we find this to be a very flexible and lightweight way of controlling your scene flow in games. So I also want to show you what that looks like in the profiler. So let's add the profiler tab. Let's drag it down here. So with profiling, we can actually have a look at what's going on with um, garbage with a GC allocated memory, right? If anything has been allocated as garbage collected memory, we can take a look at it under CPU usage here. So the way I do that is uncheck all of these, and then run the game. So you see, those are our two GC collect calls and then nothing happens. Then we wait and we wait. And then we go here. And there's our calls again. The spikes, the green spikes, show you where you have a controlled, um, where you have some control over the garbage collection. And that's how you want it to look. Otherwise, if you're setting delegates all the time because you're changing state, you're going to have garbage collection spikes all along. And when you get that on a device, and a few cycles have gone by, and the garbage collection realizes it's hit a limit, either in terms of count of collection or just total memory limit, then it will clear, and you're going to get a nasty hiccup frame rate drop. OK. So just out of curiosity for me, I'm curious, how many of you use the profiler Excellent. Thank you. OK. 
OK, so that's your basic scene loader. That's fine. So now we want to implement gameplay. So how do we do this? Very simple. Everything is controllers. You have an enemy, you have an enemy controller. You have a bullet, you have a bullet controller. This is very logical, helps you split your functionality. Most of the time, that's all you need. There are exceptions, but most of the time, controllers managing objects is the easiest way to go. For inter-object communication, you've got three basic options. You've got your static public methods, you've got your temporary public instance methods, and you've got events and messages. So the most common things you want to do in gameplay, the most common arrangement is a singleton or a pool controller. So what are these? Again, this is very basic stuff, but knowing how to do it right, getting it to work, makes everything a lot easier. So a singleton, as everyone knows, is when you have only one thing, one of these things in the game, there's just one of them. For example, score. If you only have one score in the game, it's your score. It's how well you're doing. There's just one. There's a player. It's just you. Single player game. So one. Or it's the world. Or it's the game controller. So these are singletons. OK. The implementation is actually so easy. So we'll take a quick look at one that we use in this level in the game scene. And it looks like all the other controllers we've seen so far. It's a class that has a private static instance of the same class. And on awake, we set it to this. And on destroy, we clean up. That's the simplest way you can set up a singleton. OK, and there's only one spawn controller in this example, in this template. So we use a singleton pattern. Now then, the more interesting one for me, and the one that gets a lot of uh, performance increases when people use it properly, is the idea of pools. This is when you have lots of things in your game, lots and lots of things, and you don't want to keep on instantiating, right? I, I've, I've seen that so many times. Instantiate at runtime ruins everything. So numerous instances in the game, you want to limit the number at any one time, right? There's a limited number of them. So what do you do? So you preload how many you think you're going to need, and then you disable them. That essentially puts them in your pool already. And then you just need a static public method to spawn one as required. And we do that by finding the first disabled one and enabling it. So examples for this are numerous. Almost everything in, in games is, is a pool. So explosions, bullets, enemies, scenery, all of it. OK, so how do we do it? Game objects are loaded from storage, placed in a pool, and disabled. So we do that at the beginning. Yeah. So we don't have to ever load anything from storage at runtime. So then, when we need them, we activate. We just turn them on, and then off you go. Right? Place them in the level at some point, and then off you go. But now, the gun's trying to fire. We've run out of bullets. What do we need to do? We need to recycle. So once they are no longer needed, for example, in this case, once they've left the screen, poof and you want to go back there. So what we need is a system for making a pool where it's very simple. It keeps everything disabled until it's needed. OK. So let's take a look at the agent controller, and then we can see how that works. So this is yeah. So this is in this level. So how how do we have it set up to begin with? We've got the red one, the red cube, 
which is a spawn controller, which is a spawn point, sorry, with a spawn point controller attached to it. And then we've got five bullets, right? Agents in this sense. So what happens when you hit the space bar is that the agents need to be enabled. But we start by already having them in the scene, so you never have to hit instantiate. And they all have an agent controller attached to them, which on awake disables it. That, by definition, sorry, that and the fact that we add it to an array gives us our pool. So let's take a look at the code for that so we can see how that works. So we have it sitting in, okay, so first things first, we need to make a static private list of type agent controller, called agent controllers, and this holds all the project tiles. Okay, and then let's see what we do in awake. So the first thing we do is we lazy initialize a pool. So we check, does the pool exist? If it doesn't exist, then we make a new list of agent controllers, and then we add ourselves to it. So each of those five uh, agents, when they wake up, the first one to wake up makes a pool, the second one jumps in the pool, third one jumps in the pool, fourth one jumps in the pool, until you have a pool of agents. Cool? And then... On destroy, because we're being nice, right? No broken windows. We want to remove ourselves from the pool. So, first, on destroy, I will remove myself from the pool if I'm an agent. Remove myself from the pool, and then I check, was I the last one by getting the count of the agent controllers? And if it's zero, that means we no longer need it, so we null the pool. Okay, done. But how can we get the spawn point controller to create an agent? So let's look at the spawn point controller. So we've got him rotating around, nothing special there. But we've also got him creating an agent when the space bar is pressed. So what we do is we request one. We ask the agent controller to spawn an agent by these parameters at this position and this angle. So let's look at that. So this is a static public method called spawn, which is how everything can request an agent from the agent controller. So quite simply, we look for the first free agent controller, so we iterate through all the agent controllers inside the agent controller list. If it's disabled, it's good to go. Right? So then we make sure it's got the position and the rotation as passed, switch it back on, and then we send it back in case you need a reference. Done. And then the thing that sends it back to the pool is on became invisible. I've left the screen, so disable myself. Okay. And that's how we do it. So let's see it in action. Open the main scene, hit play. Let's have a look at the game. Now look at all the agents sitting in the hierarchy. They've all been disabled. Let's spawn a few. You see them getting enabled, and then they leave the screen, and then one, two, three, four, five, they get disabled again. So, yep. Now you've got a pool of five bullets. So what you do is you figure out how many bullets you need for your game, make sure they're all there at the beginning, and then you never have to instantiate one. And memory is super clean. Okay. So for those of you who want to take a look at the code for yourselves, go to google, g-o-o dot g-l slash xn So you can download the template project here. It contains the scene state machine that we looked at earlier. 
and it has the pooling code as well as, of course, singletons. Um, now, take the code and make it work for you. You don't have to use it outright, but we found it's a really good basis. I've had a lot of guides use this as the starting point for very, very successful projects. So please take it and make it yours. But remember, as you modify it, let's remember the core principles. These are your best practices. Use C Sharp. Check your naming conventions. You want to be organized to have a logical folder structure. You want zero tolerance for warnings and errors. Zero tolerance. No warnings, no errors. And then you want to really, really try for zero tolerance for runtime memory allocation. No runtime memory allocation. OK, thanks for listening to me today. I wish you lots of joy, Phil, development in Unity. Kamsa Hamnida. Do you have any questions? Yes. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Um, I have a question. Um, I, I saw the previous lecture in, in about the Unity 5. Yes. Uh, Unity, among the Unity 5, one of the among uh, Unity 5 features uh, was about multiple scenes. I'm sorry? Multiple scenes, multi scenes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yes. Yeah, I, I heard of that yes. in the last section. And I wonder, uh, if, I, if I apply the, the architecture in the multiple scenes, um, I, I think, I guess, the JC collection is, uh, has a problem in, at, in, during the long time. Yes. So do you have any solution for that? At the moment, no. Uh, because multi-scene editing is still new, and you do want to watch out for, for collection, right? You don't want to do that um, at runtime. So because you're doing multi-scene editing, it's not runtime. You're, ki you're kind of going to run into that issue no matter which way you look at it. Um, I'm working on a solution to it as multi-scene editing becomes more straightforward, more uh, commonplace, more mainstream. Um, you can drop me an email with your question, and when I have a solution, I will be sure to get back to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Yes, I see a hand at the back. Yeah. 패키지들을 옮겨서 사용하는 사용하다가 업데이트가 이제 패키지가 필요할 경우에는 그 정확하게 그 옮긴 위치로 매칭이 안 되고 다시 그 모든 패키지를 복, 중복해서 가지게 되는 문제가 있는데 그런 거는 패키지를 어떻게 다른 폴더 타겟으로 들어가게 할수 있는 방법이 없는지에 대한 궁금증이 하나 있고요. 두 번째는 그 네임스페이스를 사용하는 게 이런 폴더 구조 관리하는 데나 스크립트 구조로 관리하는 데 가장 유용할 텐데 현재로서는 모노 비에이버 클래스는 커스텀 에디터를 만들지 않는 이상 그런 네임 스페이스를 적용하는 게 굉장히 어려운데 차후에 그런 거에 대한 지원 계획이 있는지 궁금합니다. Okay, so I'll 
try to answer your second question first. I'll probably need you to ask the first one again. Um, so in terms of namespaces, um, I don't see a problem with any support for namespaces in Unity. I use them all the time to separate uh, my scripts into different namespaces. What, what is the problem that you are having with, uh, with implementing namespaces in Unity? Monobehavior를 상속받은 클래스는 정확하게 그 게임 오브젝트 어태치가 뭐 네임이 안 맞는다는 현상이 일어나면서 어태치가 안 되는 현상이 있거든요. 그 부분은 어떻게 제가 이미 해결됐는지 모르는 건가요? You mean um, classes that derive from mono behavior? Uh, yeah. Um, you are trying to do what? You are trying to create your own? I try to attach the, the, the class in the game over there. There is some kind of name conversion problem. So, I'm not sure. There, is, there, there are some changes to the way uh, that that class works. I'm not sure whether it will address your issues, though. But I, I understand what you mean. I don't really have an answer for you. Um, I don't think you can use namespaces that way currently, but there may be changes coming soon. Okay. Yeah. And your first question again is about... It's about when I try to organize my external libraries in one folder, yes. I try to move it, and it's worked until I try to update those kind of yeah. libraries. When I try to update the library, it's just everywhere, everything is getting mess. So you, you've got an external library, and then you try to update it, but you've moved it. Yeah, so just, it, I mean, when I first download the external library from yep. the asset store, yep. then I imported it from a package, yes. and, I try, and I moved that library in a folder or such names, external library folder. Yes. And when I update the, those library, mm -hmm. and that library extracted is just outside of folder. Right. Yeah, just it becomes duplicate. duplicate in so I'm not sure which, which uh, asset you have downloaded from the asset yep. store, but if it's expecting to find itself in a particular folder and you've moved it to another folder, then you may be running into issues because of that. I know that the, I've, I've made some assets for the asset store, and sometimes you want to be specific, right? You want yeah. to name your folder as an asset creator. You want to name your folder appropriately and maybe name it after your company or something as well so that when other people release an asset or something that may conflict with your asset, it will always look for folder names or for maybe a naming convention that has to do with something that you set up, your standard. So if you're renaming an asset that you've got off the asset store, I can understand if there's a conflict, but I don't know which asset it is, so I can't give you a specific answer. But maybe that's something you want to think about. Maybe you could, you could put it in a, in a larger parent folder. Yeah, yeah, that's what I want. Does that work if you do that? I mean, I use the large of external library, mm -hmm. so Every, if, when I try to make a project, mm -hmm. I have, a, I guess, seven or eight different external libraries. Ah, okay. Uh, then I want to put in just one external library in mm -hmm. every, every library. But mm -hmm. what, I, what really happens when I update it, just yep. that my updated library doesn't come to the external library portal. Yeah, I understand. It just go outside of root folder, so... There's okay. There's become a duplication problem. Yes, I can understand that. I think that makes sense. I think that is by design. Yeah. So it looks like you cannot do what you are doing currently. Okay. Yeah. Cool. But if yeah. you want further help, if you want to show me an example of this not working and you'd like me to have a look at the, your project in particular, okay. please drop me an email. Okay. All the people I meet, I, I always ask them, you know, send me an email, give me a Dropbox of, your, of just a small version of your project so that I can see your particular issue okay. and maybe I can try to help. Okay. Yeah? Thank you. Yes. One more. Wow. 
네, 그. 오케이. Okay. 예. 어떻게 보면 되게 기본적인 질문일 수도 있는데 이 질문 드린 이유가 어 아까 그 소스 상에서는 이제 보통 루프문을 포문을 많이 쓰잖아요. 뭐 자료 그러니까 템플릿 자료 구조나 일본 뭐 어레이 같은 걸 돌릴 때 근데 이제 템플릿 자료 구조 같은 경우는 그 포이치를 써 가지고 굳이 뭐 아이 인덱싱을 안 주고 자동으로 이제 그 객체를 이렇게 포이, 포이치 문 상에서 받아서 쓰는데 인터넷 상에 떠도는 그런 어떤 <웃음> 소문에서는 포이치 문조차도 이제 디바이스 상의 그 메모리를 일반 포문보다 더 조금 잡아먹기 때문에 그거조차도 이제 자제해야 된다는 얘기를 많이 봤어요. 근데 그걸 생각하고 저도 개발할 때 대부분의 이제 루프를 돌릴 때는 포문을 썼어요. 근데 이제 아까 짜신 소스를 보니까 포이치 문이 있길래 물론 이 부분은 C샵 언어 개발자분한테 질문을 해야겠지만 어쨌든 디바이스 상 유니티에서도 이제 디바이스 모바일 디바이스를 지원하시니까 뭐 PC 분 PC는 솔직히 상관 없겠지만 모바일은 그런 사소한 메모리에도 되게 민감하잖아요. 그래서 과연 이 포이치 문을 쓰더라도 뭐 크게 퍼포먼스 상의 문제가 없을지 그걸 좀 질문 드리고 싶습니다. Okay, um, you've answered your own question a little bit. Which is good. Um, the the best way to find out to find out the answer um, for your purposes is to test, right? So you write the code that you need to you need to write. You put it in Unity. You check the profiler, and you deploy to device, and you check for hiccups. And if it's okay, the rest of it is academic differences, right? Because it depends. You sh you're right. The C# -sharp developers might know more, right? If it's a small amount of memory, or if it's a large amount of memory, if it's increasing your allocated memory for gar for garbage collected memory, you want to know about it. But if you're looking at the profiler and you see the memory is staying low, you're okay. No problem. So you trust your profiler. You trust your device. I don't know about the internet. I would be careful. <laughs> I hope that helps. 네, 감사합니다. Okay. 프로파일러 짱입니다. <웃음> What was that? Oh, thank you. I think so too. Okay, anyone else? I bet everyone really wants to have dinner. Yes, one more? Yes. Uh, a Korean. Yes, it's Korean. 네, 한국어로 하겠습니다. 네. 그, 저기, 게임 개발하면서 이제, 어, 그, 함수에 이제 매개 변수들을 전달할 때 좀, 그니까, 제네릭하게 그러니까 일반적인 형태로 전달을 하고 싶어서 이제 그 오브젝트 오, 오브젝트의 그 박싱을 시켜 가지고 이제 그 리스트를 전달하는 방식을 썼는데요. 그렇게 되면 이제 C샵에서는 그 프리미티브 타입을 그 오브젝트로 변환시킬 때 이제 박싱 언, 언박싱에 대한 이슈가 있다고 들었어요. 그게 그거에 따라서 이제 메모리 얼케이션이 발생할 수 있을 거라고 생각을 하는데 그게 성능에 어느 정도 영향을 미칠지는 물론 테스트를 해봐야겠지만 만약에 그거를 회피할 수 있는 구조가 있다면 어떤 것을 제안하고 싶으신지 듣고 싶습니다. 오케이. Okay. So in a way What we are trying to do with our architecture is to avoid some of those issues. Um, I think you're right. I think there is a problem with boxing and unboxing. Um, but again, if your tests show that your memory is okay and the way you have written it works, then that's what matters. But if I discover a method, to solve your problem, if I understand it correctly, um, email me 
let me know your email address and remind me of your question and I will send it right back to you as soon as I know. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. It's been a real pleasure. I hope I helped a little bit. See you later, next time. <laughs>